Hello. For this week, we're going to uh, discuss the Book of Mormon, uh, some historical context and content from Enos through the Words of Mormon. That's the reading chapters from Come Follow Me for this week. And I love the historical side. I uh, have a degree in history, so this is a fun section for me. In fact, I think I would really like the large plates of Nephi with all the history that's on it. But let's take a look at a, a little bit of the genealogy, because uh, I think there's some things that will really help us uh, with this. One is we, we know that Lehi had many children, including Laman, Lemuel, Sam, Nephi, and then in the wilderness, Jacob and Joseph were born. We also know that he had sisters. Nephi mentions that. And we don't know where their ages are at, whether they're older, younger, or somewhere in between, and how many. We don't know those things. He did not include that. But we do know those things are involved. We also know that Nephi... It was his lineage that the kings were uh, set up. In other words, they even called the next king after Nephi, Nephi. And they do that for we don't know how long because it doesn't tell us. We know that they lose that by the time we get down to uh, Mosiah because obviously Mosiah is not called Nephi. Let's keep going here. We know that Jacob is the record keeper. Nephi gives the plates that he created to Jacob, and Jacob's expected to keep them and record a history on the larger plates and the more spiritual things about Christ on the smaller plates. He gives those to Enos, which is where we're at in our readings this week. It's really interesting. In Enos chapter 1, the first verse, Enos is pondering about all of the things that his father has said. Now, we don't know who the first born Nephite or Lamanite was in the new land, but Enos is the first record holder to be born in America. Remember, Jacob was born in the wilderness, traveled on the boat, but Enos would have been born here in, a, in America. Uh, probably not the first because Jacob was younger. Laman, Lemuel, Sam, and Nephi, being much older, were more likely to have children born here in America. But it'd be interesting to find out who was the first. But Enos is the first. American-born prophet that we know about. Now, Enos has the record, and he gives them to Jerem. And I added a few dates just to help guide that, that are given in the records there that are kind of fun. We also have Jerem gives them to his son Omni, who gives them to Amaron, who then gives them to his brother. Now, it's interesting why he gives them to his brother. And what's going on at this place? To see this, let's go back to Omni in chapter 1, verse 5. It says, Behold, it came to pass that 320 years had passed away, and the more wicked part of the Nephites were destroyed. I'm curious how you can judge that. How do you know that the more wicked ones were destroyed versus the more righteous ones? Well, he tells us, if at the end of verse 6, he says, Inasmuch as you will not keep my commandments, you shall not prosper in the land. But verse 7 is the answer here. Wherefore, the Lord did visit them in great judgment. Nevertheless, he did spare the righteous that they should not perish, but did deliver them out of the hands of their enemies. So here we have a great prophet historian sharing with us how the Lord sifts the people, how he chooses certain people to go into certain battles and survive and certain people who don't. Now, I don't think that's the case in every battle, and I hope not to make that judgment. But right here, our prophet uh, is clearly telling us that that's the case, that the Lord is uh, allowing the more righteous part of the Nephites to remain. Now, go to verse 9. It says, Now I, Chemish, write what few things I write in the same book with my brother. For behold, I saw the last which he wrote, that he wrote it with his own hand, and he wrote it in the day that he delivered them unto me. So it's interesting that he's giving them, Amaron, giving them to the brother the same day he wrote them. Okay, here's my record. I'm writing it here, brother. I'm giving you the record. And after this manner, we kept the records, for it is according to the commandments of our fathers, and I make an end. And behold, this is verse 10, Behold, I, Abinadam, am the son of Chemish. 
Behold, it came to pass that I saw much war and contention between my people, the Nephites, and the Lamanites. And I, with my own sword, have taken the lives of many of the Lamanites in defense of my brethren. Verse 11, And behold, the record of this people is engraven upon the plates which is had by the kings. Now, if you remember on our little chart over here, there's another line going up through here following the kings, and they're keeping track of the history, the records, the wars. But the prophets here are keeping only the record of what is bringing souls closer to Christ. But they're not writing much during this time period. Possibly because at this time period, there is a lot of warfare, little time, and maybe little spiritual... Uh, inspiration that would be inspiring these writers to write. Which, notice what he says in verse 11. This is the middle of 11. I know of no revelation, save that which has been written, neither prophecy. Well, why not? Maybe it's because there's warfare going on, and, and apparently a lot of it. Verse 12, Behold, I am Amalekai, the son of Abinadam. Behold, I will speak unto you somewhat concerning Mosiah, who was made king over the land of Zarahemla. Now, if we look here, that Abinadam gives them to Amalekai, but over in the king's line, somewhere down here, they don't have the name Nephi under every king, but there's a king whose name is Mosiah, and there's been a lot of warfare during this time period in here between Lamanites and Nephites. And what we learn here in verse 12 is that Mosiah was warned, and this is the middle of verse 12, he being warned of the Lord that he should flee out of the land of Nephi. And as many as would hearken unto the voice of the Lord should also depart with him out of the land with him into the wilderness. Now this has happened before in the Book of Mormon. So let's review a little bit what happens here. And we know as they depart out of, the, of the, the land of Nephi, in verse 13 at the very end, they travel through the wilderness until they came down into a land which is called the land of Zarahemla. Verse 14, and they discovered a people who were called the people of Zarahemla. Now, there was great rejoicing among the people of Zarahemla, and also, Zarahemla did rejoice exceedingly, because the Lord had sent the people of Mosiah with the brass plate, with the plates of brass, which contained the record of the Jews. And let's do 15 as well. Behold, it came to pass that Mosiah delivered that the people of Zarahemla came out from Jerusalem at the time Zedekiah, king of Judah, was carried away captive into Babylon. Okay, so let's take a look at our chart here and see where we're going from here. Let's review a little bit about land. When Lehi first landed in America with his family, they called it the land of first inheritance. And they remained there for some time until Lehi died. At the time Lehi died, Nephi takes anyone who would follow him, which we know is Jacob, Joseph, and others, and they flee to a land called the land of Nephi. They name it after Nephi. They say, after Nephi dies, we're going to call the next king Nephi. All the land of Nephi. Well, now we've gone, if you can just look here, a couple hundred years, we have warfare because the land of Nephi is not far enough away from the land of first inheritance where the Lamanites live. The Lamanites have grown and they have spread they surround it, and the Nephites can't keep the Lamanites out of this land. So what happens? Mosiah, in a dream from the Lord, says, we're out of here. They go northward. Now, in the scriptures, don't get that confused when they say they go down into the land. In our minds, we look at a map, we always think down is south. Geographically speaking, in the Book of Mormon, it's not. It's the opposite. So when it says we went down into the land of Zarahemla, they're going northbound. So they go northern, and they find this group of people who left Jerusalem about the same time Lehi did. Most think he left just before Lehi. This is what we'll call the Mulekites. And they live here in America, north of where the Nephites and Lamanites have been living for some time. 
but Mosiah's people take them and they meet up and they combine their two great peoples. They're, they combine them. And Mosiah is made the king. Mosiah is uh, a prophet and a leader, and he does some wonderful things here. Let's go to read a little bit more about this. Omni chapter 1, verse 17. Mosiah discovered then that they had become exceedingly numerous. Nevertheless, they had had many wars and serious contention had fallen by the sword from the time. And their language had been corrupted, and they had brought no records with them, and they denied the being of their creator. And Mosiah, nor the people of Mosiah, could understand them. Interesting notes here, what we find out about this people here. That they didn't have a record, so you can see the value of keeping records of Lehi needing those brass plates. They had had many wars and contentions. So their group of people haven't been isolated. It does not say with the wars have been internal or if there were some other native people that they've been fighting with. We don't know that. But they've rejected their creator, it says, or denied him. So what do they do to fix all of this? Verse 18. Mosiah has all of the people of Zarahemla taught their language. Now again, after several hundred years, this language is going to adapt, change, and so forth. We don't know exactly what it looked like or sounded like. Now in verse 19, they're all united and Mosiah was appointed to be their king. Now while Mosiah was their king, another historical artifact is brought forth. Verse 20, a large stone was brought unto him with engravings on it. And he did interpret the engravings by the gift and power of God. Now, we don't know how he did it, just like we really don't know how Joseph Smith translated the gold plates. We really don't know how. We've seen some historical clues, and, and you can find some evidence of things that he may have used to help him, but we really don't know how. But here it says that Mosiah, likewise, he interpreted the large stone by the gift and power of God. Verse 21, the large stone gave an account of one Coriantumr. Coriantumr and the, and the slain of his people. And Coriantumr was discovered by the people of Zarahemla. And he dwelt with them for the space of nine moons. Notice how they kept track of time. Well, so what we see, the people of Zarahemla had one Coriantumr who we know came from what we call in the Book of Mormon the Jaredite dispensation from the Tower of, of Babel. We'd have a whole other line coming down over here with Coriantumr, who was the last Jaredite. This is what currently we call the record of Ether, the Book of Ether in the Book of Mormon. And they were here and they found the people of Zarahemla. Well, he did. So now we have Mosiah, Zarahemla all gathered together into one Nephite nation. So let's keep going down here a little bit. Now, just to help us out with the record, we know who this Mosiah is. He is the father of Benjamin. So when we start the book of Mosiah, and Benjamin is now old in the book of Mosiah, and he's turning the kingdom over to his son, who he names after his father, Mosiah. Amalekai, who is the record keeper, decides he's going to give the record to this King Benjamin. So if we look at this again, King Benjamin is going to, for the first time since Jacob, well, actually since Nephi, is going to be the political leader and the religious leader, all into one. Even though we obviously know Mosiah was a great religious man, followed the, the, the promptings of the Spirit. But Amalekai was the record keeper. And again, Amalekai, why did he give up the record? Well, it tells us that he had no children. It says, verse 25, And it came to pass, this is Omni, uh, verse 25, I began to be old and having no seed, and knowing King Benjamin to be a just man before the Lord, wherefore I shall deliver up these plates unto him. So Amalekai gives the plates to Benjamin. So Amalekai is really a contemporary with Mosiah. They both are older and they die. Amalekai has no kids. Why not? We really don't know. However, 
we know that during the reign of Mosiah and Benjamin and Amalekai, there's major wars and contention. It's possible that all of his children are killed in battle. Uh, Mosiah's son, the king, uh, lives on, and he turns the kingdom over to Benjamin. And we find out in the beginning of Benjamin's record, he goes through much, much warfare. And we don't find his spiritual insights until we hit the beginning of the book of Mosiah. And at that time, Mosiah is an older king. Now, we also know from this record that there's a group of people at this time that say, you know what? We like Zarahemla, it's great, but we want to go back to the land of Nephi, where we came from. And we know from the record there's a large group that they go and they end up getting into a civil war and conflict. Remember, most of them die and there's only a group, a, a group of them that come back. And then we know that a second group will leave. And Amalekai mentions that he has a brother in that group. And, and we know later on in our record that his name is Zenith. And that's all the stories found in Mosiah chapters 9 through 22. And we'll get to there when we get to that section of King uh, of the record. And we know Zenith's son is Noah, who is a horrible, evil man. And that's where we get the record of Abinadi and, and Alma and so forth. So here's just a brief uh, outline. I hope it's helpful as you read this. You can study who's who, where are they at, who's related to who, and, and who has the record and so forth. I, I hope this is helpful. You can pause this at any time as you go through your, your readings or, or write it down. But notice that this video has been created to help us just with historical uh, background and context. And not so much, it's not intended to be a Sunday school class. It's not intended to be a, a Relief Society or priesthood class. That's where you would take what you've learned and studied at home and you bring it together to discuss, to share, and to testify the true doctrines that you've read during the week. For example, in this week's reading, if I were a Sunday school teacher or teaching another class in church, I would say, what doctrines have you learned from this week's reading? Which ones would bring us closer to the Savior? Well, a few of the possibilities. There's a lot about prophets in here. There's a lot about record keeping and the, and the value and the importance of recording, especially spiritual promptings and following those it would be great to know what was the spiritual prompting your first uh, member of the church in your family history? What caused them to possibly, if they were a pioneer, what caused them to leave their comfort, their home, and move to another, another place? Something caused them. Or maybe you had a, a relative who left uh, another religious organization and joined the church. What was going on in their heart and in their mind to go through that? I would love to read those things. Or maybe you're the first one. And how important would it be for you to write down your testimony? What was the motive? What was the inspiration? What was your feeling? Write those things down. We've learned that keeping the commandments is so important. And all blessings come from those. In the Doctrine and Covenants, says all blessings are predicated upon the principles of obedience. We've learned that there's a group of people twice so far in the Book of Mormon, well, three times, that they leave evil because they've been prompted to. Now, today we have not been asked to physically get up and move from evil because we know that it's everywhere. Uh, there, you can't live in a town that is a perfect Zion-like society. You can't. So how can we symbolically move from evil? Uh, an effective Sunday school teacher might ask a question of, what have you done in your family to move away from evil in your home or your family? How, what blessings have you received? And with that, we've seen that there's people who do a lot of warfare and fighting, physically fighting. Maybe you know someone who's in the military. How are they fighting for what's good, what's righteous today? And then again, maybe we can ask symbolically, what's worth fighting for? You know, some of you parents or grandparents, sometimes you let your kids do certain things that's not worth fighting for. Well, what is worth fighting for? 
And in here, we also have lessons, especially with, with Enos, who pondered and prayed over what his father Jacob taught and wrote. And as he's reading those records and the power of teaching children and powers of families, these are some wonderful doctrines that when we gather for Sunday school or priesthood or Relief Society or Young Women's, <clears throat> we've already studied at home. We don't need to review the historical context or doctrine, except maybe a few seconds to get everyone, this is where we're at in our record. But this gives us a time to teach, to share, to testify, and let others share their testimony. And I think we can do this not just uh, as we gather physically in a class, but I think we can use technology to do this. Share testimony uh, that we have gained in one of these doctrines or principles with family members, with friends, with neighbors, with with our classes. Uh, and there's some creative ways we can do that. So I hope that you have some fun and learn and, and uh, share, uh, explain, uh, share and testify of gospel truths and principles. And I hope this has been helpful. Next week we will discuss the... Uh, next week is Easter. So I'm taking Easter off. You can do that lesson on your own uh, from Come Follow Me. The week after that is Mosiah 1 through 3. But what I plan on doing is I will create this video uh, of historical context and content for Mosiah 1 through 3 next week. So you can have it before you start your week, or you can use it at the end of the week or sometime in between. Whatever will be most helpful for you. Uh, if you have any thoughts or comments, feel free to make some comments, give some feedback. If there's something specific you would like uh, or have a question about, uh, if I don't know the answer, we can search for it, or we can just say that, or maybe there's some insights we can share. Meanwhile, have a great day, and may the Lord bless each of us as we study the gospel. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.